Well, that's what made Boys in the Hood so uh, revolutionary. A story in that world, in you know, a old black cast uh, set in South Central Los Angeles, was really not something seen from a studio level movie. And that's why there's only one producer on it too. And when it came out, or when it got uh, um, accepted at Cannes, three or four other people tried to climb on as producers, <laughs> <Of> <laughs> but uh, they didn't get it. Misery was aptly titled. Uh, my son. Uh, I was going from 6th grade to 7th grade, so I really kind of wanted to spend the summer with him. So we, as a family, we went back to um, Boston. He wanted to go to the, uh, to the Basketball Hall of Fame. And uh, Stephanie Elaine, my friend, uh, who was a... Um, um, she was the development person at Columbia, one of six or seven there. She said, I just read the greatest script I've ever read in my life. You have to do this. And I said, you know, I want the summer off. I'm tired. And uh, that misery was a horrible, horrible, long job. And, uh, but to get her off the phone, I said, okay, just FedEx it to me. So I got it uh, in two days. I sat down. You know, my test is if I read it in one sitting, then uh, um, it's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I'm I'm from the I'm a hippie. I'm from the '60s. I, uh, social justice is very important to me, and the script for Boys in the Hood just really hit me some right there in my heart. And, and so I said to Aaron, my son, I said, "Well, I'm gonna probably take this job." And he said, "Good, do it." <laughs> you know, he was at that point where. He knew more about uh, NWA than I did. I never even heard of NWA. And he, so he, he kind of uh, brought me into the rap world. So anyway, I, I met John. John was 20 years old, I think. His mom uh, lived in Pasadena, and I did too. So we met at his mom's house. And I said, uh, why me? And he said, because you made my favorite film of all time, Stand By Me. Mm. And uh, I said, OK. And uh, I think we can we can work. And it's funny because when I was working on uh, a few good men at Boys in Hood, had come out, and Rob Reiner uh, asked me one day in a maxi van we were on a location scout about why did uh, you know Doughboy fade away like we did in Stand by Me when Chris you know goes away, and I said. It was an homage to Stand By Me, man. I mean, the fat kid wears a striped shirt in it, too. You know? he, he missed that one. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, I loved to watch the Channel 5 10 o'clock Sunday night news. Cause, and I called it the murder news because it was a roundup of all the Crips and Bloods and shootings. And, you know, I, it, was, it was an hour devoted to South Central's yeah. bleeding. Yeah. And, um, you know, and everybody didn't say it this way, but this is what they were thinking. You know, why, why, are they, why are they killing themselves? What's going on? Well, who gets what out of any of that stuff? After Boys in the Hood came out, that stereotype was over. That was Ricky Baker dying in the alley, and that was a doughboy cruising the streets looking to do the job that the cops don't do down there. And um, all of a sudden, you know, a whole stereotypical, unwanted, not, nobody even thought about what life was like down there. That part of the world turned into real human beings. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's what films don't do enough of anymore, you know? They don't, they don't, have, they don't have heart and they, do, they don't try to teach. And we're in a world today where we have so much opulence, yeah. so much opportunity, and the one thing we don't have is the ability to get along with anybody, you know, because we all think everybody else is fucking nuts. And uh, um, we learn emotionally through the stories that we tell. You know, it's very, very important. You know, pe people say, "Oh, you worked in television. Now you worked in movies. You know, what did you really do?" But um, if you do it with all your heart and you strive for excellence and you get really lucky and work on good projects, you've done a lot for 
the overall general health of the community. Yeah. And that's what was incredible about Boys in the Hood as well, is that John Singleton wrote that from his point of view and really about him growing. I believe in Lawrence Fishburne, that the character really was based on his father. Furious, uh, absolutely. Growing up. And yeah, Danny. Yeah. So it really brought a, a humanist point of view to an area that was just sort of stereotypes completely. Have you heard the story about uh, PB's, uh, uh, PB's Playhouse? Oh, I believe uh, John Singleton was a PA. He was, he was the door was guard on that, and yeah. uh, Larry played um, Cowboy Curtis. And so Larry tells the story, it's great. He says, this, this kid who couldn't have weighed more than 40 pounds and had the geekiest looking thing, he says, I'm going to write a movie and you're going to be in it one day. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, you know. And... Uh, yeah, you know, it's pretty mad. I I could tell you boys and that stories forever. You know, day one, first day of uh, casting, right? John, Larry comes with us, uh, and we go to Jackie Brown's office. The second guy in the door is Cuba Gooding Jr., and the third guy in the door is Morris Chestnut. So I said, well, we we got Trey and Ricky. Should we just go have lunch now? <laughs> And that was, uh, I think, the first leading role that Cuba Gooding Jr. really ever had. Oh, Cuba, Cuba Gooding, Nia, Nia um, uh, uh, what's the name? Who played the mom? I can't remember her name now. Um, Morris, Ice Cube, uh, you know, a lot of people, including Larry. Larry uh, had been in, I think, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, but had, ne had never had, yeah. you know. The, Briefly in Apocalypse Now. Well, yeah, yeah when he was, like, <laughs> 14 or whatever he was. Yeah. 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 So that, uh, that movie, there have been several movies where a lot of people have, have come out of them, but that was certainly one of them. Yeah. And that was all shot on location, really, for the most part? Yep. Or was any studio work done on that? Any sets built? Or that was really... Uh... I had been prepping Rain Man um, before it fell apart when Marty Bress was going to direct it. And... Um, our offices were next door to the offices where they were uh, prepping colors. The shot pen, uh, um, uh, LAPD movie. Oh, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper's, yeah. yeah, colors. And, and so I would, I would go there and I would walk by their art uh, department and see, you know, the fancy murals that are going to tell the story of this wood and all that. And I said, you know... I hate that when Hollywood goes to the ghetto and then brightens it up. So we intentionally, and I, and I, I really did this. We hired uh, Bruce Bellamy to be the art director. Bruce had been a set a, a, literally a set dresser once on a show, but he was John's friend. And so we, we found all the locations. We shot all on location. Um, and that's how it felt real, you know. I mean, they're, they're, when it first came out, people said, was, was that a documentary? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Because it has such a great sense of location, a great sense of place. And, it does. Uh, and I believe John Singleton was the youngest director and also the first black director ever to be nominated for an Academy Award. Correct on both things. The, the proudest moment in my life, um, other than the birth of my kids, we were in Cannes. Uh, we were not in competition on Boys of the Hood, but in the audience was... Spike Lee, Quincy Jones, uh, uh, you know, all of the great black actors of, the, of their day. Um, I was sitting next to Frank Price, who was head of the studio at the time. Right behind us was Roger Ebert and his black wife. I don't think they were married at the time, though. Uh, Chess. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, we had tested this, the, the movie a couple of times in, in L.A. We knew it was going to play. We weren't quite sure how it was going to play in French or French subtitles. So the uh, lights go down, the movie plays out, movie's over, the lights come up. I look up, people are hanging off of the balcony trying to get John's attention to say how great it was. The whole, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore of black artists and filmmakers is on their feet doing that. I turned around, Roger Ebert is crying his eyes out. It was... It was one of those.